Hello, my another guest is uh, Martin Hamilton, expert on emerging technologies and futurist at JISC, a charity fostering the use of digital technologies in research and education in UK. Martin, welcome and thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you for having me. Thank you. There's a lot of excitement among the advocates of open science regarding the crucial and beneficial effects of openness for scientists and for the global society. Uh, however, there are people more skeptical about it, about these new trends in science. What's your personal view on this subject? So I, I think it's very interesting to take, the, to take the opposing view. So let's say, actually, let's not share anything. We're going to keep everything to ourselves. You can't see what I'm doing. I'm just going to keep it to myself. It's very hard to argue a case for that. Once you, start, when, once you invert this, once you say, let's keep things closed, uh, you know, as, as the taxpayer, I'm a taxpayer in Poland, what right have I got to see this research that's happening at the University of Warsaw? It's very hard to argue a case for that. And I think that speaks volumes. It's very easy to argue a case that says, I have every right to see this work which I have paid for. Implementing complex and ambitious ideas uh, so that they were truly effective uh, demands very good planning, demands uh, sustained funding, and some sort of political goodwill. And nowadays, the U European Union provides funding for building the infrastructure to support open access and to support open data. But who will pay for it in the long run? So I think, I think there's a very interesting dynamic for, for government funding of research, which is we are still in an, an austerity era. It would be nice to think that um, the, those years of, of economic downturn were behind us. So I think there is a very real risk that governments will say, okay, we've put enough money into this, this is operational now, this is, this is no longer an area of research, this is business as usual. And I think that's not true. I think we need a further period of sustained investment to get us to the point where we actually understand how to do the open science, how to do the open data, reproducibility of workflows, re, uh, reusability of software. These are all truly R&D topics right now and, and I think government funding is essential to keep, to keep the momentum going so that we really figure out how to do them. Uh, I think interoperability is one of the most important factors as, as for us open data is, um, is concerned. And uh, what is most crucial in this regard? Data formats, metadata, uh, repository software, or maybe international policies? What do you think? I think that there's, there's a, an ecosystem that we're starting to see, and this is in, in no small part due to the efforts of people involved in initiatives like EUDAT, CASRI, and the work of my colleagues at the Digital Curation Centre. Um, we don't know the answers to all these questions. There are some, um, for example, there are some metadata standards that are quite well established, such as uh, Dublin Core, yeah. for instance. And then there are whole areas where um, the standards that exist are perhaps um, are derived from proprietary software, and there are all sorts of questions about will I still be able to use this stuff in 10, 20, 30 years time. And those I think we really need to pick away at. We need to understand not just what we will do with our software, with our data in, in a matter of five, 10 years. We need to understand what our children and our grandchildren will be able to do with it. So let's talk now about JISC, about your institution. Uh, JISC supports the development of, of digital technologies in, in education in UK. Uh, what are the areas you, you mostly focus on? So I'm personally, I'm very um, interested in what we could call the iPad generation. So I, I have two young children of my own, and they're just going through school all their lives, every screen has been a touch screen. They've always had a connection to the internet. They don't know what it's like to not be connected to the internet. They haven't yet realized 
I think, what it means to be able to, um, to have the world's knowledge, uh, all of human knowledge, at their fingertips. It's there, they haven't quite realized, even, even my, my older daughter who's seven, she's just starting to figure out that she can ask Google for answers to almost any question. Now, those, those kids, and you know, my kids are just two kids of, of millions, but those kids will go through school, they will, hopefully they will go to college, but what they expect and what they need from, from college, I think, will be hugely different because they will have been in that position where they can say, I want to know this, get the answer immediately. That was never possible for someone of my generation. And our systems aren't presently set up to support that iPad generation. We need to figure out what their needs are going to be and how best to support them. And do you think that they miss something in comparison with the pre-digital generation? Is there any kind of danger or threat to their identity or whatever? I think that um, you, you could say, oh, well, people are, people are in a culture of oversharing now. There is this tendency to post everything that you do to the internet. And in fact, I, I've been playing with a, a life logging camera. So I have a little camera here that takes a picture every 30 seconds and then you, you have that uploaded to the internet. Um, the, the thing that I've seen with my kids, and I, I don't think that they're in any way unusual here, is that they're a little bit suspicious about, let's call it oversharing, that, and that question about, well, who is going to see this? What is going to happen to this? This thing that I do, this picture that I take or this um, drawing that I make, if I, if I use a computer, if I use a tablet, if I use the internet, what actually will happen to it? Who will be able to see it? And I think that's a, a byproduct of children being very, um, very intensely interested in, in peer groups. So will my friends see it? Will somebody who's not my friend see it? What would a stranger think of it? These are actually things that they really do think quite a lot about. And they're just applying, if you like, we could call it playground logic to the internet. Okay, so uh, my final question would be about uh, policy for the European Union recommends open access and open data to the member states and in Poland we are currently working on the appropriate policy and I would like to ask you what would be your recommendation or kind of suggestion where to start, how to develop the, the best, uh, the optimal uh, policy, uh, what's the, wh what would be the best practice recommended? So from UK experience we've seen that um, sticks, we would talk about sticks and carrots, sticks are all very well but if you give people only sticks then they tend to um, not receive the uh, direction with good graces. So if you give them some carrots as well some incentives, then they will say, "Ah, oh, mm, yeah, okay, maybe, maybe I should look into this." So what we did in in the UK was we said, as as the research funders, we said, "Well, you will produce open access publications, and and we will start to open up your data, and in return, um, for example, there are um, pots of money that each institution has been given." Uh, to help them with article processing charges to get um, publications out in open access journals. So it's not all stick, there is some carrot, and I think it's the proportion of those two things. How heavy handed could you be in saying you will do this, it will work like this, and how much of a, an incentive can be provided? It may be that en enough actually is to set a direction of travel and to say, look, we think this is a really good idea. Let's start on this journey and let's figure out what support you need to get you there. Martin, thank you very much for your time and this interesting talk. Thank you.